Highway Advisory Commission. First, I'd like to read a statement. The Highway Advisory Commission was created to advise the Board of County Commissioners in matters involving policy and philosophy related to El Paso County transportation operations and activities. The Highway Advisory Commission members have the responsibility to review and comment on items and proposals specifically related to issues concerning the county's policies and philosophy on the management and operation of the Department of Public Works transportation operations and activities and to make recommendations to the director of Department of Public Works and or the Board of County Commissioners. Members are charged with protecting the desires and interests of the entire county and shall consider all aspects of the issue at hand, analyzing all factors to determine what is in the best interest of the entire county. Next, I'd like to do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, and with liberty and justice for all. Next item on the agenda is absences. Uh, right now, we only have one requested absence. And that is from Ed, Ed Hool. Um, he uh, had a conflict today, so he's uh, requesting that he be excused from the meeting. Do I have a motion to approve that absence? Larry, Larry. excuse the absence. Do we have a second? Dave Zelenock, I see, seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right, thank you. Meeting minutes approval. As we've had uh, several comments go back to Yana uh, concerning the uh, minutes and she made some minor changes to her original uh, submission. And uh, I've read them over and they look uh, really good. So unless someone has any questions or comments concerning the minutes, do I have a Proposal to approve the minutes of the October 21st, 2020 um, Highway Advisory Committee meeting. This is Tom, so moved. Do I have a second? Cheryl seconds. Tom uh, was uh, first and Cheryl was the second. Do we have any? Additional comments concerning the minutes. All in favor of approval of the minutes, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? None being so, the minutes have been approved unanimously. Um, we now go into the commissioners and citizens comment phase. Um, I noticed uh, one commissioner, Holly, uh, her picture disappeared just a minute ago, but I know she's on. So uh, do we have any other, do we have comments from either Holly or the other commissioner? <laughs> well, none. None being so, I'm not quite sure what happened, but uh, we do have a couple other items that uh, we need to discuss within the comment period. So I'll go on to those and uh, we'll come back again and uh, check with the commissioners. Um, first thing I'd like to discuss is that uh, Cheryl will be ending her term uh, on February 1st, 2021. And she is also a member of the Pikes Peak Rural Transportation Authority Citizens Advisory Committee. Now, at that time, um, she will drop off of that position also. Um, the county has three um, 
positions on that board. Uh, one of them is held by me, one of them is held by Richard. Um, but we will have that vacancy uh, on February 1st. And I'd like to uh, see if I have any um, people that are on the Highway Advisory Commission uh, that would be interested in possibly, you know, requesting to be placed on that committee. I will tell you that it is a committee that uh, meets once a month for approximately two hours. If they don't get into too much discussion on a particular item, <laughs> sometimes of which we do, as Cheryl knows also and Richard does, uh, it is on the first Wednesday of every month. The meeting starts at one o'clock and is hopefully over by three or before. Um, as with this meeting, uh, they are also online all the time at this point. They do not have a schedule as far as when they may, uh, you know, go back to actually meeting. The meeting is actually held um, when you're, um, the meeting actually is held down at the uh, downtown at the Pikes Peak um, Rural Transportation Authority headquarters, uh, which is just off of I-25 and Bijou. Um, the meeting, what we do is that we go over items that are contained within the Pikes Peak Rural Transportation Authority project list. Uh, right now, we're still dealing with the A list. We're not sure if we'll get to anything uh, on the B list before 2024, um, but we do review the projects both from individuals standpoints, El Paso County, City of Colorado Springs, and three other small uh, cities in the county that are also part of the PPRTA. Um, it is kind of an interesting uh, group because of the fact that we look at all the major projects that have been approved by the citizens uh, in 2014. Uh, that list, many of you probably still remember, uh, hopefully voted on it. And so it, uh, um, we do deal with those particular projects. Um, sometimes uh, it entails approval of additional funds, sometimes additional uh, change of scope of work uh, transfer funds, any different aspects. So it is kind of an interesting uh, group that uh, sort of complements uh, what we're doing here for just El Paso County. So at this point, I'd like to open it up to see if anyone has any questions or is interested in putting in an application for that third position uh, from El Paso County. Larry, uh, this is Dave. Z. I might be interested. Uh, I, if somebody has a burning desire that really, really love to do it, uh, that's fine. Uh, I'm intrigued enough, at least, to maybe have an offline discussion with you and Cheryl, and just get a better understanding uh, as to the depth of involvement. And in, uh, like this, com this commission, I think, is a great example of one where we can make a difference. Uh, if it's a rubber stamp one, uh, no offense, uh, there are a lot of committees out there looking for stumps to sit in chairs, <laughs> and that's just not me, as you probably know. Yeah, Dave, I've been on it for a number of years now, and uh, the packets range from 60 to as much as 200 pages of study beforehand. Uh, there are votes taken. Um, sometimes the board goes along with what we suggest and recommend. Sometimes they don't but it's an opportunity for a group of people to engage uh, and flesh out some ideas. Uh, I think it's also a good opportunity for the uh, member governments to present to a group that will ask them a lot of hard questions and get them prepared for the board. And thanks, Tom. That's some additional information on that. Um, it is... Well, like for example, the uh, to the old Colorado City project, uh, which has you know been wrapping up for several months now. You know that was a combined project of both the 
city, county, state, and uh, that was one that came before uh, the Citizens Advisory Committee over time as far as additional funds because they ran into uh, problems as you would expect on that type of a construction. And yes, as Tom indicated, uh, sometimes, uh, most of the time, I would say that the board, um, and it's sort of like the same situation we have with the uh, hack here, is that we can make recommendations, but the final authority, approval authority, is with the county commissioners. And the same applies to the uh, Pikes Peak Rural Transportation Authority Citizens Advisory Committee, is we can make recommendations. They accept almost all of them um, after we've had some of them lengthy discussions and votes on them. So uh, it is uh, a situation where um, we're not necessarily a rubber stamp, Dave, but we do make rev recommendations uh, to the PPRTA board, which is made up of uh, uh, people from city, county, and the small uh, cities and uh, they're the final authority, just like what the county commissioners are with our particular projects. Well, that, well, that has to be. First, my memory. So, so are the same commissioners uh, that sit on the PPACG executive board, are they the same commissioners that oversee the PPRTA? Or is there a slightly different mixture of commissioners? No. This. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, good. Hi, Holly. Oh, there she is. <laughs> hey. Um, so it's it's a different group and technically the PPRTA is supposed to be separate from the PPACG because it doesn't include Fountain. Oh. Uh, and Fountain has some serious and Fountain and Monument are not in the PPRTA. So and there also is at the same time an at large alternate space available. So two people from the commission could, could apply. And we really rely on the CAC, but I do expect you to attend every single meeting. So, if that Thank helps. It does. What do you think, Dave? You think you might be interested or would you like to talk to Cheryl and I offline? You know, you, you, I think the two positions open, I think we sit in at least one of them, but, uh, whether it's the old or the prime state, but, uh, but yeah, at least Pennsylvania, for any level of interest in one or the other, as I said earlier, if somebody has a deep burning desire, they, they really would love to serve in this pattern, uh, I would happily take maybe the, the, the backseat position on it. Uh, but if there's no one necessarily that has that desire, I'd be glad to be considered. I have no standing conflicts on the first, it's the first Wednesday at 1 p.m. I have no standing conflicts that would keep me off that one. Thank you. Well, if I don't hear from anyone else, which I haven't so far, um, Dave, what I would like you to do is to submit a letter of application uh, for the position to the county commissioners uh, through Yana, and then she will handle it. Of course, the final approval is the uh, county commissioners, um, but I don't see a problem with that. Uh, like I say, two of us are already on the board right now, and Cheryl had been. And uh, we've, um, I don't think any of us have missed any of the meetings. As Holly said, sometimes it is, you're supposed to be there, but as uh, there will be sometimes emergencies which can be, you know, taken care of. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in doing it, Dave, I'd like you to, like I say, go ahead and uh, submit a letter of uh, application uh, to the county commissioners through Yana, and then she will handle it from there um, all the way through the approval uh, by the county commissioners. It's a large meeting, right? So Cheryl served through February? That's correct. So she would, she would still go um, to the February 1st meeting um, and then you, if you uh, want to go with it and approved by the commissioners, your first meeting would be March 1st. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Or, or the first, first Wednesday in March. I don't have a calendar right yeah. in front of me, uh, but it would be the first Wednesday in March at uh, 1 p.m. Okay. 
Well, Larry, thank you. I, I'm leaning toward, I, I may also want to call maybe one of the uh, staffers, maybe I'll speak to Jen or Scott or somebody just to get a sense for what I'm getting myself into. So so, so I know the bed's on fire and, I, and, my, and my eyes are wide open. So. <laughs> well, one thing I will do, tell you, Dave, is that um, Rick Sandenberg, who is the mm -hmm. sort of the liaison with the PPRTA CAC, just as Yana is with us, he uh, met with both me, Cheryl, and Richard, and he went over the procedures and everything. So he or he sort of indoctrinates you on the procedures, okay. um, gives you a lot of information. Um, he's a real good source, and like I say. Um, if you become our third member, then what would happen is he would schedule with you a time that you and he could meet and he would go over all the policies, procedures, uh, even past histories, which um, when uh, we went, when Cheryl and I went and met with him, it was kind of interesting. He brought out some history of the uh, PPRTA that I'd completely forgotten about. <laughs> so he's the, he's the historian of that uh, process and he can answer and like i say he will give you a training session and an indoctrinate indoctrination you know of what we uh do and he uh if he still has a lot of information he'll also pass that on to you okay thank you <laughs> Well, I thank you. I'm kind of leaning into this one, so thank you again. If, uh, if as Holly said, someone else has interest as well, uh, there's strength in numbers, and three does love company. So I'm <laughs> happy to at least to uh, put my name partially in consideration. I'll make a few phone calls, and uh, I'll, I'll circle back. Let you, Larry. Thank you. Well, unless uh, unless I have someone else step forward, I'd like to have um, a nomination. Uh, first and second from the board that we advance Dave as our third member on the PPRTA CAC. Do I have a motion for that? Cheryl, did you raise your hand? Yes. That's what I thought. It was sort of off the screen there, but... <laughs> do, do, do I have a second? Sorry. All right, there we are. There's our second. Um, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right, thank you. And Dave, thank you for stepping up to be the third member um, from the county on the PPRTA CAC. So like I say, if you'll get a, um, a letter through Yana, and when that's approved, like I say, Rich, Sand we will notify Rick and he will schedule with you a time that uh, you two can get together and he'll go over uh, all the policies, procedures, give you a lot of uh, history on uh, what has occurred with the uh, CAC. Thank you. And thanks, right. everybody. Thank you, Dave. Hi, this is Tiana. May I ask who seconded? I cannot see you all since I'm sharing the agenda. Mr. Ferguson. Thank you. And this is Stan. Uh, congratulations, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, thank you, I think, Mr. Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, 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 speaking of vacancies, uh, refresh my memory. This may be a Yana question. Are there other vacancies that we have on this committee or commission? Uh, I think there's is there one at large, two at large at this point, uh, with Cheryl going off. We do have one at large that might be filled actually in January um, or February when Cheryl leaves. We are working through that. We also submitted another application for another associate member that's in process. So we would end up having one associate position uh, available. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I have a question for the commissioners. Do you know uh, what is your procedure and when will we know who our co assigned commissioners are for the next year? 
Stan, do you want to take that one? We think it's, it might be me and Stan. It might be me and Terry Dyke. Yes, that's right. So uh, what I, I think what kind of backing up and not getting into any particular form of commitment per se, but um, every, uh, every new board uh, decides uh, committee assignments and we have 50 committees, give or take, that we have to do assignments to. So a highway advisory commission is definitely one of them. So uh, that those decisions are not uh, final at this time. Uh, and uh, so, um, but uh, to, to, to Holly's point, there could be some movement on several of our boards. And uh, one of those might be, uh, you know, we have a new commissioner coming on board. It's important that she gets a good, healthy mix of uh, different uh, uh, boards. And because she's District 2 and there's lots of road construction in both District 2 and District 1, there's a little bit of logic uh, for maybe uh, Holly and Carrie to be our two uh, liaison representatives to this board. Uh, but we're still working on uh, uh, those assignments and that will actually be voted in uh, I believe in the January 12 meeting. So, um, so the, it won't be final until that day. Um, but, uh, you know, however that plays out, if I end up uh, stepping off of this board because I'll have other commitments, uh, I'm not saying goodbye yet because I don't know that we're there yet because we still have to finalize the negotiation. But, but if I do step off on the board, I'll probably attend in the January meeting and, uh, you know, offer my thanks to to everybody, you know, on this committee, because you do you guys do great work. Um, we have a ton of really great committees that do a lot of work on behalf of the county. And, you know, one of the key things that's so important to us, but just maybe is obvious to everybody, these committees, which are filled mostly by, um, you know, citizens that have uh, uh, public interest concerns and interests, it's just great that we have so much uh, citizen participation that helps the county, uh, you know, helps helps give advice to the county and helps us run a better county. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's one of the great values of, of uh, these committees. So we do move around, um, uh, you know, from uh, time to time. Um, so that's a possibility that that may take place. It might it might end up being Carrie and Holly uh, for next year. That was a long-winded answer to basically repeat what Holly said in a very short time period. <laughs> but hopefully you all appreciate it. <laughs> they are all formalized on the 12th. So. Yep. Well, which commissioner would like to go first to uh, make any additional comments? Oh, uh, let's, uh, let's let Holly go first. Yes, I will. I do apologize. I never can quite figure out how to get in on Skype with uh, <laughs> muting, but I think my computer can handle it now. So many, many things. Um, just so you know, uh, Dave, if the, the Pikes Peak RTA um, would probably work targeting a renewal three for 2022. So the next two years will be quite exciting, looking at different projects and such that we wanna make sure get on that list. And I know our staff and the city of Colorado Springs staff is working really hard to get those going already. Um, I will say we had as um, CCI a meeting with Senator Faith Winter. She's the head of the Senate Transportation Committee. And I think it was House Rep Matt Gray. Um, he's the vice chair of the transportation committee and, um, they talked about where they want to see transportation go in the legislative session. It was not an encouraging from a conservative viewpoint, an encouraging discussion. They want to raise fees. Um, there's new climate bill out there that the governor expects us to meet climate standards. And they're pretty positive that even the smallest podunk town wants a bus. So um, it's not gonna be the kind of solution that we would want. Um, I think that um, but that's where they're headed. And they think that this year they can get to a transportation solution. But the problems is that Dr. Cog still wants to go off on their own and do a sales tax. And um, 
if we start doing these kind of things, um, I, I highly doubt, unless it's statutory, that Dr. Cog would give up their share of the CDOT money. And um, so if Dr. Cog went off and did a sales tax and Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments goes off and does a sales tax, then you start to get into, as my husband calls it, the balkanization of the state. You're really going to lose a lot of rural counties and rural roads that need to be done. Um, I would hope that maybe there's one last chance effort to do something statewide that would help out the rural areas if we're going to move into a balkanization of the state. But things go slowly in transportation. They always do. Um, curiously, when they started talking about climate standards, I remembered at PPACG, our climate standards are so great in Colorado Springs that we were able to be the first organization statewide to pass what is called a ozone advance plan, meaning that uh, we've met our ozone standards and we can actually look forward to the future. Um, and that, so we passed that this past month. We did in our budget process, approve 3 million for the I-25 gap and through Jennifer's creativity, um, as well as Victoria Chavez's, we should be almost at our full commitment for the I-25 gap. It was a frustrating vote, but it had to be done. Um, and so that means we hope in 2022, three million will be coming to roads. Um, I think that the overturnment of the Gallagher Amendment, I don't know how that's going to affect um, our budget come 2020. Two, we are still, even for 2021, we're over our TABOR revenue limits. We didn't expect to be that. And so my hope is, is that um, we'll have to see how it works when we come to 2022 to see, you know, as property taxes will start to go up because we're not going to, you know, instead of dropping down to a 5% or a 5.5% assessment rate, we're going to still be at the 7.1% assessment rate. So it will be really interesting to see that how that affects our budget. And if in future years out, we end up having enough money to go back out to the voters for a Tabor reset. And that's, you know, we figure that's got to be a pretty large amount. I know Stan can run the numbers better than I can, but um, it has to be around 15 million at least before we consider that, I think. But I'll let Stan comment on that if he wants. And that's my report. And then hopefully, uh, in January, I'll start on the Statewide Transportation Advisory Committee. We do have a new Statewide Transportation Commissioner for our region. Um, they didn't choose the one I wanted, <laughs> but um, it's, it's an attorney down here, and hopefully I'll get a chance to meet with her, and we'll set up that meeting and have her come to the January Area Council of Governments and get her going and see how great she is for our region. We're excited about that. All right, thank you, Commissioner Williams. Commissioner Vanderwerf. You're muted. You're muted, Stan. Gosh almighty, I, I thought I was going strong there and I had the mute on. So I, I wanted to just say thanks to Holly's comments and a, a, a little, a few additional comments about um, the replacement for Irv Halter. And you, you may remember that uh, this board was working on getting uh, Irv Halter to come and meet with you and, and talk a little bit. So now that we have a replacement for Irv, uh, um, that we should work on uh, when she settled in uh, an opportunity for her to speak uh, to this commission. And uh, my apologies, I cannot remember her name, but she is a, a local lawyer from in town here. Uh, and uh, she practices environmental law. So she's very tuned into uh, environmental issues. And that probably means that um, her background and her sentiments will fit uh, the uh, sentiments of the current governor's administration. So you can take that for however you wish that you know, whatever meaning you want to get from that. Um, but uh, she's a longtime lawyer in town here working on environmental law. 
I'm told she's a very nice lady, and I have not met her before. Uh, it was a bit of a surprise appointment. Um, uh, she had applied, and I, I'd never even, I never even had heard the name before. Uh, I, I, you know, I think maybe one, if I have any concerns about her, is I'm not so sure how much she knows about transportation and infrastructure issues, but that's maybe something uh, that we can work on uh, with her, and it'll be important. I think something that'll be very important is to make sure that she does represent our community here in the Colorado Transportation Commission Board, the state board. Uh, so we do need to take the opportunity to get to know her, to, to work with her, and make sure she has an understanding about you know who we are and what our interests are. Uh, also, uh, Holly did mention um, you know the I-25 gap and uh, some of the uh, processes going on there. Uh, obviously, you know, it's great that we've got the extension of the road. We still have concerns. I personally still have concerns about the toll lane. Uh, but in the um, interest of moving forward, uh, we did have the county team do a lot of negotiating with uh, CDOT, with the governor, and also with the federal government uh, about trying to reduce the second seven seven point five million dollar uh, commitment that I didn't think had really been fully vetted uh, in the in the county. Um, so uh, they were able to work on an approach to basically using the toll lane that's getting added into I-25. There's a federal program that allows for um, funding from the feds because you're you're adding toll lanes to highways. You can agree or disagree with that point of view, but the program exists. And so what the state was able to negotiate with the federal government was uh, about $4 million or something a little bit less from the federal government coming to the state of Colorado. And then we got a commitment from the state of Colorado to use that money against the, that remaining uh, $7.5 million commitment. Uh, and that reduced uh, the need for El Paso County to have to provide all of that funding so uh, in order to close out the remaining seven and a half million dollars, we needed uh, to pony up about three and a half. And we did do that um, in the 2021 budget and we did vote for it. Uh, so uh, that uh, what I believe that, that that does for us is that gets some of the funding controversies uh, with I-25 off the table. It doesn't solve the uh, toll lane. Uh, challenge, but you know, one of the things that I think is important in working with CDOT, uh, I, I call it a kind of a, a carrot and a stick approach. Um, when we see good behavior from CDOT, we want to thank them and, and appreciate that. And when we see bad behavior from CDOT, we want to remind them of that as well. So in this regard, uh, like with the I-25 um, construction, we want to thank CDOT for the work they're doing in getting this road built. But we do want to continue to remind them that the community does not have uh, a sentiment about the appropriateness of that toll lane. Um, I think in going forward on I-25, we need to, this year in 2021, start a conversation with CDOT about turning that into a four-lane highway instead of a three-lane highway. That is, in fact, not an exceptionally expensive proposition, but we, you know, whether it takes us 10 years or whatever to get to the fourth lane, we're going to need it because we're going to have Denver and the city of Colorado Springs as two city pairs, two big, big gigantic population centers in Colorado. And we've got to have a big highway between those two in order for our infrastructure to work right. So I think uh, in 2021, we need to start the dialogue when we talk about I-25 about closing up the I-25 work, but also immediately getting into a discussion about a fourth lane on I-25. Even the even the CDOT research says that the three-lane highway is only going to be valuable for a few years before we need to move into a total of four lanes. And then uh, Holly also mentioned uh, the Tabor excess amazingly here in 2020, we ended up with an overage above and beyond our Tabor limits even in um, a terrible economic downturn year. The primary reason for that is uh, because this was the first year where uh, El Paso County started collecting sales tax revenues 
from internet sales. And that's because of the Supreme Court case that took place the previous year. So we still have suppressed and reduced sales tax revenue from economic damage in El Paso County due to COVID from our local businesses. But the internet sales tax revenue has more than made up for that. Now, the interesting outcome of that will be as uh, soon as we get through the vaccines and hopefully completely remove uh, coronavirus as an issue from our community, we're going to find ourselves with both internet tax revenues and local sales tax revenues. And that means, uh, I think, a, a, an amazing uh, cash flow possibility in the second half of 21 and certainly a huge cash flow opportunity for the county in 2022. We'll probably get to some pretty big numbers about Tabor overages, and I think that will lead us to um, a serious discussion amongst the commissioners about asking, uh, possibly asking to place on a ballot measure um, a Tabor reset. And why that's important to this commission is it feels to me that the, the area of uh, the county that needs the most budget, needs the most addition of budget, is our infrastructure. So if we end up going through a Tabor reset process, and that would have to be all five commissioners, you know, uh, wanting to go forward with that, that'll be a discussion next year. Um, but if we do that and the voters uh, um, agree to that, uh, I think what we would be interested in doing is putting the, the vast majority of that money uh, into our infrastructure to make sure that uh, we continue uh, to get to, uh, you know, a better road system. Having said all that, in the last couple of years, we've made huge improvements. We've made a lot of progress, and I'm really proud of our public works department and what they've been able to do. We've talked about it extensively about the recapitalization and the increased uh, productivity and some more work going on with roads. It's just that we have so much more to do. So I think those are the three main things. Uh, Holly actually touched on it, and I just expanded a little bit further on those. I would say, though, uh, um, um, sometime in the spring, we do need to invite the new transportation commissioner uh, to come to this commission and you can express to her, you know, our needs and our interests and our community desires for uh, better infrastructure. So I'll finish with that and thank you for the time. Commissioners, I have a question. This is Larry. Um, from your both Holly's comments and your comments, Stan, is it my understanding that with the federal revenue that we were able to get through the state, we have now completely paid off our commitment to the I-25 gap project. So that from here on out, any additional funds that are created will go to the county and not toward I-25 gap. That is, uh, 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 go ahead. Well, we should actually let Jennifer address that too. We are 500,000 and we only did 3 million this year. So we did yeah, right. very, very creative sources. Jennifer and Victoria, we just approved something else at PPACG. And so um, we should let Jennifer, you know, address that to see how we may have to approve 500,000 in 2022 and we may get something else. I mean, the state, when they shut down the economy, all of a sudden they became a lot easier to work with. So, uh, Commissioner. Holly, uh, yeah, Holly, thank you for that correction. Um, my sense of it is, though, that. Uh, Larry, may and large, as a generalized statement, um, your, the answer is yes to your question. Uh, the good faith negotiation that the uh, county leadership did, uh, which included Jennifer, in fact, I think uh, much of it was Jennifer's ideas. Uh, so, uh, and we do need to give her an opportunity to respond to that as well. But um, I think we've, we, we've been able to kind of basically work through uh, but the challenges we had with how we were going to deal with that second 7.5 million. Regardless of what's been put into the 2021 and 2022 budget, I think past that, I'm not aware of any additional commitments that we need to do in El Paso counties uh, for the I-25 gap. So I think, you know, the remainder can uh, can go forth on uh, our local roads. And well, and, uh, oh, go ahead, Larry. 
Yeah, and I have to agree with you. You know, five hundred thousand dollars is still a lot of money, but in relationship to what you were looking at before of you know four million dollars plus that you would still have to come up with, um, I guess five hundred thousand dollars is a little bit more workable than having to come up with four four and a half million dollars. So that was really good to hear that that uh, the staff and the commissioners approved that and. You know, we got that funds from the federal government. Yeah, there was uh, some other needs as well. Uh, um, you know, CDOT was uh, really, really interested in getting this issue resolved, and they really wanted to see at least some additional commit commitment uh, from the commissioners here in El Paso County. And uh, we we basically delivered on that. I think had we uh, gone a different direction, there would have been some additional challenges that would have been caused by that in a, um, a relation, if you will, a damage in our relationship with CDOT. So, uh, you know, again, part of this is about carrot and stick. We got to cooperate with CDOT where it makes sense to cooperate and we need to challenge them when we think they're making a mistake. So, uh, you know, we have to worry about that relationship. I, I have to tell you, I think in the last couple of years, we worked very hard on that relationship with CDOT, and there's been a lot that has happened using CDOT money in our community, and I think continuing that relationship will continue to help that. Now, having said all that, and I'm forgetting the name of the intersection, but CDOT is no longer able to fund that great separation on the intersection in the northeast part of El Paso County, and that's that's a very badly needed project. Uh, Jennifer can talk more about that, and hopefully in the next year or two, we'll be able to get CDOT to get that money back into place. Yeah, and that's uh, Powers Boulevard and uh, Research um, Intersection. Yeah. And, and hopefully, yes, they can get that uh, going again, because I went through that the other day and talk about a mess. Well, I tell you, that's, uh, you know, when we have the Transportation Commissioner come down here, she actually lives in Colorado Springs, so maybe giving her a tour of that intersection uh, and showing how bad it is and how much of a challenge it is. She may know already, but we want to make sure she does know. So when she's in her commission meetings uh, for the state, she'll be fighting to get that, those, that funding restored. All right. Thank you. Do we have, Joanna, do we have any citizens' comments? that we need to address. You're still on mute. So right now, and Natalie will gladly that again at the end of the meeting, I will check with Natalie and see if anyone had a comment or question. So before we adjourned, we will double check on that. All right, thank you. Um, moving on then, we will go into staff reports. Uh, start off with administration. Uh, Scott. Hey, good morning, commissioners, members of the house. Um, uh, happy holidays to everybody. Normally, we would uh, we would be looking forward to an in-person uh, social gathering following this meeting. Uh, you know, everybody's favorite COVID-19 has precluded that for us. Uh, in fact, it has precluded that for our entire workforce. So, um, one of the things that we are trying to do to try to maintain some sense of normalcy is uh, tomorrow we're gonna we're gonna with a with a lot of help from the highway leadership team and county administration we're gonna do a drive-through holiday lunch and give folks a package hopefully still a warm meal that they can enjoy uh, as best they can in their in their vehicles uh, as a way to at least recognize their hard work for the year and acknowledge them and give some sort of semblance of normalcy to what we're doing. Um, uh, with that in mind, you know the the this has been a very busy season for us. The COVID has created some challenges for us uh, in our workforce. You know, we've been for months now doing a, a staggered arrival, staggered departures, you know, strenuous cleaning of equipment, uh, health checks, all this good stuff. Um, and uh, we've been relatively fortunate in terms of uh, the health of our workforce. Uh, and I'm knocking wood as I'm saying that because we still have a long way to go. Um, We've had a we've had a number of folks get into to, uh, varying degrees of quarantine based upon secondary exposures, 
uh, in other places. And, uh, you know, we've been working very closely with our human resources department to manage that. And I'm very proud of our leadership team for, for taking control of what is a, was a very awkward and very challenging situation as we try to get work done. Uh, our workforce continues to be flexible with with uh, the COVID-19, although I think we're all probably a little bit sick of it, if I'm being honest. Um, <clears throat> the commissioners uh, addressed the budget approval process and the funding, um, you know, where the, where those funds are going and what the future looks like for us. I think uh, in, in relative terms, I'll just say that we probably still have a relatively small bill to pay on the gap. Uh, that number fluctuates day to day, depending on some of these other approvals on the work that Jennifer and her great staff put together. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of creative thinking with with county staff, our staff and the commissioners to get that thing moving. Uh, and we look forward to uh, to uh, that proposed additional funding in the 22 and beyond budget for our roads, our road network. And we're starting some some uh, processes here to figure out uh, programs that we can either accelerate or improve efficiencies on using those additional funds as they come in. Um, We've uh, we've had a few ongoing, uh, I'll use the term loosely, snowstorms here in the last few weeks. Uh, most of them have not produced a whole lot of volume, but they have eaten up a lot of our labor. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things about snow removal operations as we get into it, I, I like to look at these storms as kind of practice storms. We, uh, we can kind of shake the cobwebs off our processes um, and on our, our application of materials and go forward from there. We haven't had the you know, massive amount of moisture uh, show up that we in some ways need and in some ways don't want, you know, it's kind of a mixed, mixed bag there, but uh, our folks are working hard on that. And we're trying to trying to stay committed to that effort once we get into it and not, and not yank people around. So that's been a, an ongoing challenge for us. Um, we, we are continuing our normal operations. I won't steal any of Troy or Jen's thunder out of their presentations for you. Um, we are, also uh, winding down our uh, CARES Act projects here um, in the building. We're getting into the final stages of acceptance and the information technology is going into our uh, reservable workstations. And we look forward to getting back to some semblance of normalcy in the building with a vastly improved situation in terms of workspaces and social distancing and physical security for our building. Um, when we get it all said and done, perhaps we can, uh, if we're still in this kind of environment, we'll do a video tour. If not, we'll do an in-person tour of some of the things we have going on here. Uh, our folks have been very adaptable and, uh, making the situation work for them during this construction. But if you've ever lived in your house during renovations, it gets old after a while. So, uh, we look forward to getting that, that behind us in the rear view mirror and moving forward. Um, it's been a great opportunity for us as an organization to improve our circumstance um, during the, during the, the COVID-19 using CARES Act funding to do it. Uh, in addition to that, also using CARES Act funding, you know, one of our bigger challenges is, uh, our in-person workforce, uh, specifically in the highway side of the house. Um, you know, we have, uh, by our very nature, we were designed with large numbers of people and crew vehicles moving out to, uh, operational environment. Uh, we've done what we can to separate them, try to limit to two folks in a vehicle. Uh, by begging, borrowing, stealing, retaining old vehicles, repurposing vehicles to get there. Um, we now are in the, in the throes of upfitting vehicles that we have received uh, through CARES Act funding, which will allow us to spread those folks out. And also uh, a, as a function of, of those vehicles arriving, we've equipped them appropriately to make our work zones much safer. And I know Troy's got some pictures in his presentation about some of the traffic control bodies uh, that have come in, it, it's going to allow us to be a lot more uh, efficient and safer in our work zones. And we look forward to using those uh, once we get the training up and running on them. And then we've got some some heavier equipment that is still in the in the process of being built. Um, they just they're so backlogged with uh, supplies and materials and workforce to get those to us from the vendor. Uh, but we'll get those sometime next month and uh, that will vastly improve our situation. Uh, in terms of work zones. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about those things and I look forward to taking care of our workforce with that. On a, on a you know, kind of on the transparency side of the house with a lot of help from county uh, PIO and some help from IT and a lot of great work by our leadership team, 
We have gone uh, public facing with our PQI data. There is a searchable map that people can look at the condition of their roadway. Uh, with Natalie and her help from uh, her team and, and uh, our folks over here, we have been able to put together a good executive summary of our pavement quality index data and what that means, wrap some context around it so folks can get on there and look at the condition of their roads and see things like that. Um, in addition to that, uh, on a weekly basis, we are now um, in a public facing manner, publishing our two week schedule, our predicted schedule for engineering work for highway uh, maintenance work and uh, for permits that we have issued in the right of way so that folks have some semblance of what they're going to be facing in their neighborhoods uh, and on their commutes. And, uh, you know, there's some challenges with that. It's a learning process for us as an organization. Um, and every day something comes up that causes us to change something on that list for one reason or another whether it be snow removal, whether it be a crisis, whether it be an equipment failure, whether it be a, a higher priority task that has to get done. But what it does is it's a start. It gives us an opportunity to dialogue with the public on what we're going to do in their area, the kind of work that we do. And it also allows us to capture analytically some of the challenges we face with last minute taskings or material shortages and just kind of capture that, that diversion time as we look at down the road for potentially additional resources. Um, you know, it's a, it's a learning curve. We'll get better at it. And uh, one of the things we found with COVID is that folks are home and curious. And when they see a line of, of trucks with the county logo on them, they want to know what's going on. So we thought we would reduce the amount of uh, uh, reaction and be proactive in getting that information out there. And I appreciate everybody's help with all of that. Um, I want to wish all of you a very safe and happy holiday season. Uh, we look forward to get some kind of semblance of normalcy on the other side of this. And with that, I will take your questions. Larry, this is Cheryl. I have a question. Scott, I'm concerned about the customer service um, information. It seems like the not satisfied or extremely not satisfied was much, much higher. Thirty-three um, percent were not appreciative of the work that you were doing. Do you have any background information on why that is? I I I don't. I will get some information on that. Ellen Ellen is out right now taking care of something, or I would get some background from her because she hits those surveys pretty hard. I think you know part of that is that we have we have revamped that survey a little bit, um, and I don't. I would have to to look at at where those those particular surveys have come from to speak to specific events. I mean, I can tell you that. You know, we had a we had a reclamation project that went awry a little bit um, up in the northern part of the county. Um, the results were just not satisfactory, so we we scratched our heads. We pulled some samples. Uh, we tried to figure out from a from a uh, operational and engineering perspective what occurred up there. And at the end of the day, we ended up completely rebuilding that roadway, regraveling that roadway because it was it was the right thing to do. Um, and that may be the genesis of some of that. I know that down in the, in the southwestern part of the county, um, there are some roads that we don't actually maintain that have got some serious problems with debris and trash and things like that. Uh, and that's created a lot of dissatisfaction in that part of the county. But I think, um, you know, in general terms, uh, I'm proud of the work that we're doing. Our folks work hard every day, uh, but there's, <laughs> you know, it's hard to keep people happy with our resources. Uh, we do the very best that we can, and, and our leadership team spends hours every week uh, trying to gain efficiencies with what we do. Uh, and uh, you know, we can we can make ourselves five to ten percent more efficient at the end of the day, but uh, we, we are somewhat resource limited in terms of budget, manning, equipment, materials, and we yeah, have I, a best road network that we're trying to maintain. So I don't I don't have a specific answer on that. I, I appreciate the work that you do, and that's why it was so uh, kind of alarming to me to look at those surveys when in previous survey results, it wasn't so lopsided. Um, so maybe in January's meeting, you can give us kind of a rundown on the genesis of that dissatisfaction. It could be just one job and it's one person sending multiple surveys in, who knows? So yeah. Yeah, there's some of that, but we, I will certainly d d dig uh, deeper into that and get you some answers if I can in January. Thank you. Certainly.
Scott, uh, question for you, a uh, couple questions actually. Um, how do you think that the uh, budget process came out for the public, uh, Department of Public Works uh, overall compared to say last year? And then taking, I have to say, I'm taking this as a grain of salt um, because sometimes when you read what's in the newspaper, it isn't exactly what happened. But anyway, they had a coverage uh, in the Gazette as far as, uh, you know, the approval of the budget, actually the total budget, and they also addressed the uh, DPW budget. And one of the items that they had in there was $905,000 for special high priority projects. Um, again, I have to take that with a grain of salt, you know, considering that the reporter may not completely understood what was being discussed and what was approved, but your comments on the uh, budget for next year. You know, um, this position, I, I put myself in a situation where we are, you know, we, we execute with the funds we're given. I mean, the, the, the county and the commissioners are in a very challenging spot trying to juggle the, the varying needs of all of the different county departments in, to support the citizens. Um, and, you know, we, I, I know, cause I speak to all of the commissioners at length uh, about budget all the time. And you know, I'm, I'm satisfied with the budget that we have received based on the circumstances that we're operating in. And we will do our very best to execute with those funds. Um, you know, there's a there's a lot of lines in our budget that, that I look at sort of at a higher level, and I look at, you know, what we have to execute projects with, what we have to execute maintenance with, and if there are specific funds tied to specific projects, how we execute with those funds. Um, you know, the I look I'm looking on the on the five year forecast and the the increase in that line for for uh, significant highway projects. I believe is the actual terminology of it. And what we're going to do with those funds, um, and I anticipate that in 22 and beyond, uh, those funds will arrive in our budget, and we will continue to improve our situation as best we possibly can. Um, but we are we are constantly in a state of catch up. Um, we are you know somewhere between 50 and 70 years behind in regraveling our our pavement maintenance. You know we have a continuing uh, degradation of our pavement quality index. Um, and we are continuing to to fight this uphill battle on a daily basis with the funds that we have. But uh, we also are getting a, a number of, uh, over the last several years, a number of unfunded mandates that we have to meet by either federal or state mandate. Uh, stormwater comes to mind, ADA comes to mind, 811 uh, locates comes to mind. Uh, and these are, these are things that we have, have had to put uh, funding and resources and manpower into. Uh, our leadership, our commissioners have been very gracious in, in allowing us to, to get some additional funding to dedicate to those things. But every one of those dollars is a dollar that's not going someplace else where we could use it. Having said that, uh, these are mandates. They're not optional. So we're going to execute them to the very best of our ability. I'm excited about um, the progress we have made this year and will continue to make in terms of asset management program. We have an asset management uh, manager on board now. They're in the procurement uh, throws a procurement for the, the software and then the, the data collection to identify everything in our inventory in its current condition. And once this program is in place, it will allow us to make what I'd like to use the term risk-based asset management decisions about the best place to put our dollars as we take care of our roadways um, and all of the associated infrastructure that goes with those roadways. We, uh, we've got some challenges. Um, and we do some very, uh, you know, creative work to get things done, uh, and we will continue to do so, Larry. All right, thank you, Scott. Does anyone else have any questions for Scott? None hearing. Uh, we will go on to Highway Division updates. Uh, Troy. Good morning, everybody. Troy Wheatlaw, Highway Manager. Um, I'm going to go through my slides here and recap a little bit of what Scott had already mentioned. Um, with the snow being 
as light as it's been, it's given us an opportunity to get out and do some graveling. So we've worked on big springs and meridians since our last meeting. And then we capped Howells and Arrowhead Drive up north is what Scott alluded to with the issues that we had. So we put four inches of gravel on top of that. We The material we put down had a high clay content. So with the moisture that we were getting earlier, um, it made the road really slick. So we took care of that problem. Dust abatement, we're nearing that. We're pretty close to finishing. So we did 135 miles of dust abatement this year. Uh, the chip sealing program, we completed that earlier at the end of the summer. Reclamation, that crew is rolling around, along very smoothly. We've done 65 lane miles, so roughly 32 plus center line miles. So they're doing a great job. We did some work on the Judge Orr Bridge. It's the bridge that's about halfway to Calhan on Judge Orr. So we did a lot of welding on that. I got too many screens open here. Um, striping is complete. We did 683 lane miles. I think that's the most striping we've done in several years. We're working on refining that program to formalize it into a structured um, schedule. So we're working with Scott on that also to let everybody know what we're gonna be striping next summer. Sign upgrades, we're over a little over a thousand on those. Um, customer service requests, I think Ellen included a, um, the numbers in our package, but grading potholes, dead animal and trash pickup have been the top three. They've been keeping us pretty busy with the trash pickup. Um, snow events, even though they've been light, we've done, when I did the slide, we did six, and then we had one this weekend, which was kind of off and on hit and miss in areas of the county. One of the challenges that we have had, and I keep showing our FTEs, is manning. We're still trucking along and making it work, but we're at 125 out of 150 right now. We've got eight we're onboarding, and we're continuing to push the interviews and job ads. So if anybody knows anybody that needs to work with the CDL, um, tell them to look up the county. We brought two new seasonals on this week. Uh, we've got four on board totally right now. And um, they are helping out with the crack ceiling crew. So we're working there. Three entry level positions. They're getting their CDLs. I think we've got two of three have their CDLs. So they're moving forward. And just a few pictures there. Scott had mentioned the CARES Act money, the pickup on top on the top of the photo is one of the trucks that's going to be it's a dodge we're going to be bringing those on board for the crews and uh, the sign shop truck is on the bottom we've got three of those that are on board fleets um getting those ready for us we can put cones and signs and that'll help us out in many areas with the sign and traffic shop if you've got the slides available, there's a few shots of South Meridian that we're working on right now of us graveling. And then there's a couple pictures of trash dumping. Um, we're getting a lot of issues with those right now. One example there is the shingles. People are just dropping them off. The other picture is the uh, roads that Scott was talking about down south. There's probably about, it's non-county maintained and there's probably about 20 tandem loads of debris, couches, chairs, fans, you name it, is dumped down there. So I just wanted to show a couple of those pictures, but that's about all I've got for today. It was pretty quick, but hope everybody has a good holiday. Any questions? Hey, hey Troy, I'm sorry, it's real. Hey, Troy, this is Kevin. Just real quick, one thing to add from people's understanding is that uh, there were as large piles of bags down there that had uh, kitty litter in them, which is a product used for methamphetamine production. So that's another issue that we're researching as to whether or not we have a hazardous issue down there or not that has to be cleaned up as well. And uh, thanks, Kevin. All right. Any other questions for? Troy, if not, we will move on to uh, Jen.
Uh, good morning, it's Jennifer and Irvin County Engineer. Hope everybody's doing well and has a great holiday. I'll start out with that before I forget it at the end. Just a couple of things before I start on my slides that I wanted to talk about that has been kind of touched on today. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on the I-25 gap, but um, just to let you know, if all goes as planned right now, uh, we have an approximately, um, and no pun intended here, uh, $742,000 gap on the remaining dollars. Um, we have looked at uh, possibly <clears throat> identifying $500,000 in the um, 2022 budget, but staff is working very hard to look at all different alternatives uh, outside the county budget. So we're continuing to work on that. We've made great progress. And I just want to thank um, our leadership here, Scott and Kevin, and then also um, our commissioners, and then our work with our, our partners at CDOT and Federal Highways. Um, all those people have worked to really help make that happen and, and reduce the county's uh, um, a responsibility there so and and get that into the right hands where it's coming from other sources so work very hard on that and uh, we appreciate all the support and, and getting that done and we'll continue to look at different options for that that gap um just wanted to mention the the transportation commissioner's name lisa hickey she's a longtime attorney in this in the city so um uh, and we will certainly work on getting her here as soon as she's kind of acclimated on on her role as transportation commissioner. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about the gap. Um, we just did receive, re uh, as of yesterday, um, notice that CDOT has actually completed their uh, plans for the fourth package of the gap, and that's the additional add-on of the interchange there at I-25, and, and we call it County Line Road, Douglas uh, County calls it Palmer Divide Road. But they finished their design package for the, the the interchange, so that's that's very exciting, and they're going to be getting underway next year on that project. So we've been working very hard with them on that uh, to coordinate our our County Line Road and Beacon Light Road project there as well. So good news from that uh, standpoint. Another thing I just wanted to mention that we've been working on is um, the region has and our commissioners and and the region has been working very hard on space command. And so we've been also behind the scenes working with PPACG, putting together a lot of numbers that talk about what we do as a region to support from a transportation standpoint, Space Command. So um, uh, that has been um, some work that we've had to put together very quickly so that we have that, so that uh, our region can continue to advocate for that important um, placement of that uh, program. Um, another thing I just wanted to give you a heads up on is uh, PPRTA3. Over the next year, we anticipate working with you and bringing you a list of projects to get your input on and, and some other actions. And so we're working on that schedule right now. And so just want to give you a heads up that over the next year, we will have some meetings where we will have uh, longer discussions about some of the projects and might consider separate work sessions. So we're working on that program and identifying that timeline right now and and more information to come as, as the new year comes. Um, Scott did mention the asset manager. I just wanted to mention we did talk about um, coming back to you at some point and giving you a little bit more information on that. We're not re quite ready to have all that information ready for you yet, but I do anticipate coming back to you in the first quarter sometime and talking a little bit more about what our what our high high level goals and um, what we're doing as far as the asset management program for uh, the department. And then finally, one thing I just wanted to mention is that we did have a bridge um, hit by a traffic accident on Ellicott out in the eastern part of the county, north of Highway 94. Uh, we have evaluated that bridge and um, looked at um, some superstructure replacement and entire bridge replacement. And uh, we'll likely be looking at an entire bridge replacement on that, um, but uh, more to come on that. We're working very hard to get that project under a design phase, and we've had some really good evaluation from uh, outside consultants on that bridge. So um, that bridge is is one of our lower rated bridge and uh, anyway, and would likely, uh, I think, uh, looking at replacement is gonna uh, give us the best bang for our bucks. So more to come on that one. 
and I'll go ahead and go through the uh, slides now. Um, uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the other work that we're doing. Um, and um, in 2018, uh, the Board of County Commissioners um, adopted a new Pikes Peak Regional Build Code Amendment. One of the things that the county has struggled with is some properties in the county that kind of go beyond a code enforcement action and really have some buildings that are dangerous. Um, in previous uh, portions of Pikes Peak Re Regional Building Code, um, the city uh, had a section in there that they had adopted where it allowed, if there's a dangerous building, it allowed the city and the city took the stance that they were gonna go ahead and do demolition on some of those buildings. The county hadn't done that. We really hadn't had a lot of those, but um, in 2018, we had several of those in the county that really had been identified by Pikes Peak Regional Building as, um, as um, dangerous buildings. So in 2018, the Board of County Commissioners went through a process uh, to uh, with the Pikes Peak Regional Building to update the building code. And that was one of the things that was a significant change. Um, how that affects the county is that um, the Pikes Peak Regional Building is really the building code enforcement um, section of that. Um, but what they don't do is they don't, once they determine that a building is dangerous, they do not do abatement. So that really falls on the determination of the cities and the counties and the jurisdictions. So um, what that change in the building code did is allow the county to go ahead and do abatements. So. In this case, what we have three properties in the county that Pikes Peak Regional Building has determined as dangerous. And they go through, I just wanna tell you, they go through an entire process with a property owner to, once they determine that a building is dangerous to try to make sure that the property owner is able to cure that either by demoing or doing uh, uh, replacements or, or fixing those buildings up. Um, and, and so in, in this case, we have three properties that were unable to get to that, um, uh, that place. And so these property owners have the ability to appeal. These property owners have uh, an entire process that regional building goes through um, because the, they want them to be able to cure that problem themselves. In the case where um, that is unable to occur, that's when regional building um, prov provides a notice of um, a notice of demolition and contacts the county. So, uh, and how I get involved is that they provide, um, if they're unable to comply, they provide uh, a notice to uh, the county engineer or the city engineer. And at that point, we start the process with our county attorneys to go ahead and do the abatement process. So in the county, we had three and because this was our first time going through this process, we had to develop the process and procedures to do the demolitions. And then um, we went through that with our county attorneys. And then also what we've done is uh, we then went through the process of uh, uh, creating contracts to be able to do this work. And then um, worked with our county attorneys to again, provide additional ability for these uh, property owners to still try to abate their properties. And um, in that case, once they do not do that, uh, then we all go to the county uh, court and request uh, an order uh, to be able to enter the property and do the demolition. So in, in this case at 106 Bradley, this, uh, this house had been partially burned and uh, went through an entire process. And you can see the pictures. Um, these uh, neighbors uh, adjacent to this property were just um, at their wits end. And so um, we really went through an entire process to be able to uh, be able to do this um, thoughtfully. And uh, we contracted uh, with a contractor to clean this entire area up. And so this is kind of the end state, you'll see the pictures at the bottom. And um, this process is funded by the general fund. It's not funded by Road and Bridge. And then the county has the ability to um, put liens on the property to try to um, go ahead and recoup those monies. And 
there are ways that uh, uh, the next steps are to identify whether we can recoup those monies and then uh, possibly um, uh, we may end up uh, selling that property at some point. So just a good example, uh, we have two more properties that we have outstanding that are similar to this. Uh, we did this initial one as a test case and um, are proceeding now with uh, asbestos testing of the other two properties. The other two properties are also in the security wide field area in Commissioner Lojinos Gonzalez's district. And so we're proceeding with working on those next year. Um, so just a, a little thing that we do um, that is outside of specifically Ronan Bridge, but it's something that really does help the community uh, I can tell you that those um, property owners adjacent to um, to this property were bringing donuts to our construction crews, um, and this all work is contracted out and just supervised by my folks. So, um, uh, nothing more about that. Uh, don't want to spend too much time on that. The next item I wanted to talk about is, uh, and we talked a little bit about this in our previous. Um, in our previous meeting, but um, a little bit more detail about this project is uh, Red Rocks parking. And you can see on, on the overall map there, we had um, uh, adjacent to this neighborhood, and this is kind of an enclave in the county, adjacent to this neighborhood, uh, the Red Rock Canyon open space is in the city of Colorado Springs. And they have been seeing an increase, especially with COVID, of uh, visitors to their parks. And so this problem, um, actually started in advance of um, COVID, um, but it really was exasperated by um, the COVID um, and people really were trying to get out more and more. So it was exasperated, but essentially we were contacted uh, probably about a year or two ago about some parking issues. And what we found and what we were working on is we found that Red Rock Canyon open space didn't really have adequate parking. So we worked with the city of Colorado Springs and they were in process of uh, expanding their parking areas. Um, but during that, um, what we found as we looked at the roadways in this area is that they really didn't meet the fire code to allow for through traffic um, if they were parking on both sides of the road. Um, so um, as a result of that, you know, there's a couple alternatives of things we can do. We could either expand the road, which really isn't a good um, alternative here because um, uh, we would have to do a significant amount of construction and, and then uh, uh, acquire right away to be able to accomplish that. And it really isn't uh, something that has the highest cost benefit ratio and uh, really doesn't, um, it wasn't something that was supported by the neighborhood. So they actually came forward and presented a petition to us to go ahead and sign one side of the road as no parking as a no parking zone, um, and we worked through them with that, uh, looking at different alternatives, and came up with, as you see on the map here today, um, the red side is the area that we identified uh, was the best location for the no parking zones. Um, so, uh, went to the board of county commissioners with this proposal. Um, they approved it um, and it was uh, implemented and the signs are up now. Uh, we um, have had some concerns and are working through a concern with a property owner over there that is disabled, a disabled vet and working with our ADA um, uh, department uh, over at facilities in regards to that. So um, not something that we usually do in the county is uh, post no parking zones on it within our streets, but something that was really a safety issue that we needed to address. Uh, we're monitoring that and um, we'll make adjustments as necessary on that project. And then finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, um, the, the Momsen grant. My, my apologies for interrupting, Sorry. but on that, on that Red Rock uh, thing, um, I, I recall you all had uh, mentioned to me that you had had several meetings with the community and you had basically practically everybody's signature uh, in support of putting those no parking signs up. So could you just say a sentence or two about that? Because I believe that's accurate. Um, the, the community um, and, and, the, and then also the Red Rocks um, 
uh, Friends of Red Rocks Open Space actually had meetings with their community. And so uh, uh, they did all those meetings and provided us a petition. We had a petition with uh, multiple um, properties there and um, they did all the legwork on the outreach in regards to that. Um, so we have had some questions come up, um, more specifically one property owner. And so we're working through some of those concerns. Thank you. And then uh, just talking a little bit about the MAMSIP grant, um, CDOT has primarily been working on um, Highway 94. Um, they have been doing phase one improvements on um, on Highway 94 and have been working on the westbound passing lanes. Um, they actually have those all paved and they are waiting for good weather to be able to complete the striping and open those up. Um, the next phase would be the jug handle and the signal at Blaney. So that would be the next phase. They anticipate being able to complete um, all the work within the first phase of Highway 94 in spring of 2021. On the other projects, many of those are still in design um, and they are still working through their grant for the uh, with um, federal highways to be able to get the rest of the money in place to be able to start the other projects. I spoke with CDOT um, actually this morning um, just to make sure that I had the latest information and um, they are uh, happy to come early next year to give you a better and more broader update on the grant and where they are, um, especially as they close out this um, intergovernmental agreement that they have to do with Federal Highway Administration to be able to get the, those funds in place so that they can really start uh, the bulk of the, the other work. Um, we anticipate being able to start uh, working with them on the Charter Oak Ranch project early next year to get that under construction. And so we have to wait to do that work until the grant gets in place with CDOT and Federal Highway Administration. So we've been working very hard to be able to do um, early items and working on utilities and um, utility relocations down in that area so that once uh, that intergovernmental agreement is in place, uh, that project can really get underway. Um, so more to come on that and we will have CDOT do a a higher level and broader uh, discussion on that. And they have agreed to come early next year, uh, probably February or March to give you an update on that entire project. But I just wanted to touch on that since you asked me to discuss that last time. If you have any other questions, I'd be happy to answer those right now. Okay, it seems like we don't have any other questions for Jennifer. So our next item is the annual schedule for the hack. Uh, Scott, you're up again. Yeah, I, I, Yana, if you can bring that up on the screen, please. In, in essence, the schedule that we hope to be executing while Yana's bringing it up, is uh, the same traditional schedule we have done uh, with one minor exception, and that's you know the highway update. But you know we, with our with our remote meetings and things like that, it becomes a bit more uh, problematic to do some of these things. So like like every year, it becomes a tentative schedule. But certainly, if there are things that you uh, as a as a, a commission would like to readjust the timing on, we can do that. If everybody can see that, I'll stop talking and let you look at it. How's that? Does anyone have any comments or input uh, with this schedule? Uh, Mr. Commissioner Stan, uh, maybe I, I, I might uh, not see it on here. Oh, I guess maybe it's budget discussion in February. Um, since the uh, commissioners go through, well, I guess, uh, Scott, that's, you're looking for input from the hack to build your budget so that you can present it. Is that the, the reason for the timing? 
the, the timing on that one, Commissioner, early in the year, what we're doing is is um, working 20 priorities uh, input from that. Basically, what we're doing is we're going to bring this program and where we're spending our $21 to the hack. It's, a, it's an informational brief. And then, you know, our our traditional budgeting process is somewhat different than what in this world, somewhat different than what you and I are used to in our previous life. It, uh, it, it's more like allowance than a budget, <laughs> but we do set our priorities within that allowance uh, with, the, with the assistance of the Highway Advisory Commission. Yeah, the, the only reason why I bring it up is just to make sure that the hack gets an opportunity to have some measure of influence in making recommendations on the county's budget. And if February is obviously early for for the county commissioner engagement. That it does make sense that it would be way in advance of that because they would probably help provide that to you. I'm just basically asking the question if February is the right month for that or not. Um, I will defer to the chair. I'm sorry. I'll defer to the chairman of the hat. Okay. Larry, this is Tom. I was wondering um, for consideration if we should add. I can't April hear any, any discussion two. going on. Is there some problem with the, the program? Neither Stan nor um, Scott are, are speaking. There's no audio. I was wondering if in April Hello? we should have a standing invitation for the state transportation commissioner to come in and give us an update. In April, let's see if we can address Cheryl's uh, audio. Anybody else have, can everybody else hear what's going on? I I can't hear a thing. This is Natalie, so I'm checking with our AV department right now. Yeah, I can hear everything. I feel like I'm in a Verizon commercial. Yeah, it's clear here. This is David. It's unclear. Okay, we'll keep going. So I I, I like that idea. Uh, Tom, I think we could we could certainly have a standing invitation for um, either the Highway Transportation Commissioner or somebody from CDOT Region Two uh, to come in annually and talk to us. I think that's an excellent suggestion. I'm not sure what month is the appropriate month for that. Uh, but certainly we can throw that offer out to them. Um, the, reason, the reason I offered April is because that's our highway user trust fund discussion also. So it's sort of a state focused meeting. Right. Okay. Any other comments, questions, or concerns? Well, and I guess, I'm sorry. I, I guess one question I have, Scott, is on that, uh, and this sort of follows. Commissioner Stan's comment is, you know, if we have the budget discussion in February, um, should we have that as our first discussion and then show a second discussion, at, say in June or August, as a follow up and, you know, final approval as far as where the hack would like us to go? You know, that's a that's an excellent thought. I was considering that. You know, one of the challenges that, from a budget execution perspective, is that the executive directors and administration really are in the throes of that process in about August as well. Um, and although it hasn't been on the, the traditional schedule, you know, we've talked about it. I think we talked about it in August and October as we were moving through this budgeting cycle where we were headed. But certainly, we can add it on there as a as a discussion item for. I think probably August and October are appropriate. Yeah, and Scott, this is uh, Stan. Uh, uh, kind of what prompted me to make the initial inquiry is on the October line, it talks about PPRTA budget. So, you know, it might, I think uh, Larry's recommendation is probably a really good idea. And I'll also make the point, I think it's important for everybody, uh, right? Airport, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Highway Advisory Commission is an advisory commission. So you don't hold any budget authority. So what you can do, though, is make recommendations to Scott. And, uh, of course, then he's got to, if he accepts any of those recommendations and adds it into his budget, he's got to go through an advocacy process that 
is several steps and he may succeed with that or he may not. But I think it's important that he has a sense of what your sentiments are so that, you know, if he ends up agreeing with any of that, he can carry that forward. Thanks, Commissioner. I think somebody's torturing your dog. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, she just sometimes will bark and I can't get her to stop. Once Commissioner Stan, you're you're lucky. I, I'm on mute. I have my dog start barking every once in a while too, so I know what you're going through. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Any other suggestions for topics on the on the schedule? Yeah, it looks like Yana's put a uh, the budget line discussion line in the August uh, update, so that's good. So we've got it in there already. Good. Just to confirm, this you guys would like to see it is in August with Scott's approval and everyone's. Yeah. Uh, 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 Larry, uh, if I may also maybe on the budget discussion, I know that uh, the, the one topic that, uh, that I think was in the last the very last meeting we had pre-pandemic, the commissioners uh, Vanderwerf and Williams brought up, we were talking, maybe it was January or February of this year, uh, about this uh, the, uh, this disconnect between the, the expanding infrastructure that the county has to maintain uh, and the dwindling uh, revenues uh, to maintain it, uh, that, uh, that, that projecting the two of them, the increasing size of the infrastructure and the decreasing revenues seems to be a widening gap uh, that I think w that may actually uh, lead us to a, uh, I'm not sure if it's a deeper discussion. I think Commissioners Vanderwerf and Williams had just come in the January, February meeting from a planning commission. Uh, I hate to use the word retreat because in my mind, retreat means a half day or a full day session, but maybe we can do a deep dive and uh, explore the possibilities of of how, if not to close that gap, at least to stop the increasing rate that the two lines are diverging, if that makes sense. So so, so that may mean a little wind up, maybe a, 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 a prior discussion, maybe it's a couple of discussions. Uh, it's a very important topic. Uh, I don't know that, uh, that a 20 minute or half hour discussion in August will scratch the itch of understanding the nature of the problem and then exploring. I know that there was some discussion even here today about uh, the statewide initiatives, what's going on there. Uh, but but if there are things with that the county can do, uh, uh, one, one great example I would throw out as Exhibit A is what Triview Metro District is doing, you know, where they've got dedicated funding uh, 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 that comes in to offset the growth that they're doing up in that part of El Paso County. I'm not saying it's perfect, but if there are solutions that are innovative that we can use or look at to close the gap, uh, that may be just a longer discussion than, a, as I said, than a 20 or 30 minute discussion about the budget. So uh, I don't need, know that we need a full retreat, but maybe more of an in-depth, uh, maybe it's two sessions, maybe it's a, a block out a big chunk of that time, or maybe we just always kind of look at uh, how can we help uh, the county staff and the elected officials close that gap or keep the gap from getting wider than it is. We could always have a meeting in a month where we're not currently scheduled. Well, focused on that. Well, maybe that's a good idea. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. And, you know, another thing, too, it's like, for example, I looked at the commissioner's agenda yesterday, and uh, there were a couple items on there where some additional roads were accepted into the county system again. Mm -hmm. And it seems like just about every commissioner's meeting just about every month you know there's a mile or two miles or whatever that uh, you know has been approved by the county staff to be included into the county system which just as dave says just makes that situation more difficult so yes i think i would encourage us to look at possibly having a special meeting uh, on one of those months that we don't meet and then we can have a, a full discussion, whether it's an hour or whether it's uh, two hours, like what we have uh, to go over this. In all fairness, the roads that are added into the system uh, must meet current county standards. So we're not adding crap into the system anymore. <laughs> um, there was a time when we were adding really bad stuff. 
Um, I will tell you what I have gathered from the other commissioners is, um, and we should have county finance or um, our county attorney's office come through and give a presentation on the different types of improvement districts. Uh, for example, the Pioneer Village Improvement District has 20 mil levy. That's how much it's gonna cost them to actually get their roads paved. And um, the there have been some requests from Monument to annex in Woodmore. They're starting to get requests from Woodmore, but they want us to send them money. And so um, they would have to do their own ballot issue in Woodmore to say, hey, we'll do five mills, 10 mills, and then let's talk about annexation. Um, I'm sure it's closer to 20 mills to fix their roads as well. And I don't know if that can win, honestly, because you've seen all the school district issues lose up there. Um, which I kind of hit Dave on the fact that uh, Triview Metro has such a high high mill levy, it's possible that that might keep the school district issue from losing. <laughs> so I have a new suspicion about that. Um, so getting anything to pass up there is really hard, but there's also in my area. Um, so I don't see an interest on the commissioner's level in all honesty to do any ballot initiative until after the 2022 one with PERTA. Any ballot, issue, any ballot initiative issue must occur in an odd year um, because it would be a new tax. And then um, the one thing I do see an interest in that I'm trying to start gathering resources on is maybe an interest in the monument area for some type of improvement district for both roads and trails. And um, so that will be a project I'm gonna start working on in January and it'll be a several years project to get community buy-in and support because I have a lot of people up there who wanna see their trails improved. And, um, and if we're on 65 years on road improvements, we might be on 70 years for trails improvements some days it feels like. So that's just my sense of what the commissioners are saying. And, and this is Dana, a little bit of follow-up to that. Um, you know, commissioner's interest in kind of some kind of separate ballot initiative that's, you know, dedicated to roads. Uh, uh, I think Holly is correct, but I think we've got much more potential in a ballot initiative for Tabor relief, and that's also a ballot initiative. And since roads are such an important part of what a county delivers into a community, um, when you when you put that ballot initiative together and you specifically say, you know, you're going to spend X amount of that on roads and these are the roads we're going to work on, you know, kind of the city's 2C version using Tabor relief as the as the revenue generator. I think there might be, you know, we got to wait for the vote to know for sure, but I think there might be sentiment for that. So it's not out of the uh, realm of possible that we could find a way to put more uh, a budget into uh, into DPW for roads. Uh, we're using a ballot initiative. It just not might it just might not be something dedicated to roads. It might be something about Tabor. And to Dave, to to your point, um, it it isn't really about revenues going down and number of roads going up because as new communities get developed, revenue goes up. Um, so what happens is we have revenues going up and then we also have costs going up because we're adding roads and it's really whether those two numbers are diverging or converging. So, um, so I think the conversation is still really an important conversation to have, but um, revenues always are going up when new communities are put in place. And it's in those two numbers about those two numbers that are going up, it's whether or not uh, DPW is getting enough money to still yeah. handle that requirement. So, you're exactly right. But I think one 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 overarching tenant that some governments I uh, I know have adopted. Uh, it sounds simple and maybe just needs restated or 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 or, or reaffirmed. Is that uh, I'll use air quotes here. Growth should pay its own way. That uh, that the, the, the tax the existing taxpayers should not be, as a general concept, should not be subsidizing the growth that comes out there or or it shouldn't be happening at the expense of other programs in an aggregate general sense. I think we're saying the same thing. 
Uh, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I'd love to see uh, an analysis, maybe just an in-depth, uh, just do a deep dive so we can understand what is the nature of the problem. Maybe there is no problem at all. You know, maybe, uh, and I know what the commissioners did with this year's budget uh, by, by providing public works some, some plus ups, I think was excellent. Uh, 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 that was a one year uh, great move. But if we can understand uh, the long-term perspective and the big picture, so much the better. So I think, uh, you know, we defer to Larry to see if he wants to, you know, also recommend maybe adding that on or if one of the other board members wants to recommend that and then that could be a topic. And, but there was something mentioned earlier. I'm not sure that Jana got it on the calendar, but I think that was April, maybe every year where we invite the transportation commissioner sure. and, and we get an annual update. I don't know if that had been added to the calendar yet, but I thought it was a great idea to make, to make it reg a regular meeting item. I just yeah. don't know if it got added. I, I think we'll add that as an annual item, Commissioner, and I think the suggestion about a deep dive off, uh, off cycle from the other meetings in terms of um, uh, understanding of our funding sources is an excellent add um, forward to that conversation. Um, I think that everyone on this meeting is probably very familiar with it, but if you just look at the the 10 counties tax base and where we stand, it will go a long way toward answering our funding questions. If I can add large counties. If I can add one more thing, and I, I point this out in the presentations I do, the Pikes Peak Rural Transportation Authority sales tax is generating a boatload of money. Um, it's just fascinating to me to just watch how we had our best month ever since the whole program started in October sales tax revenue. And so it's really fascinating to watch that. Um, and it, it's helpful. I, I put the charts sometimes in my presentations because if you could cut a deal with the city of Colorado Springs and say, hey, we need a half, we need a quarter cent sales tax to start addressing our roads. And you know, the Colorado Springs gets a certain amount back for powers or I-25. You go a long way to hitting the number that Scott uh, says we need every year. And so, you know, working with the city of Colorado Springs, because they're two thirds of our residents, you could actually do some sort of sales tax that would get there, but uh, it would be a lot of effort to do it. But it goes a long way to raising the amount of money that Scott needs to do the roads. Hey, commissioners, if I could add, you know, one of the initiatives that we're working here, I think I talked about in the last meeting at our at the staff level, we have a pretty good handle on what our our pavement shortfall is. Um, and that is addressed in the PQI report. But I've asked staff to take a few months and dig into um, all of our program shortfalls in all of our programmatic areas from striping to guardrail to drainage to grading to regrading uh, on the engineering side on the capital side so that we can uh, actually have a real number of what our total shortfall is because i i could give you a number right now but it would be about 80 percent conjecture at this point so i think you know that level of detail in all of our areas and you tie that with our asset management program inventory and condition report all of that gets us to a better answer to no kidding what we really need Well, I still think that, uh, you know, following up with uh, Commissioner Stan and also Dave, um, I still think that it would be beneficial if we have, um, especially since it'll probably be on Zoom anyway, um, to have a meeting to discuss, you know, this gap between what Scott has as far as the amount of money and what it looks like out there and the whole county, as far as what needs to be done, you know, a 60, 50, 60, 70 year time frame on maintaining roads, uh, I don't think that, uh, you know, is a good planning tool. And I think we need to, you know, see how we can cut that down. And even if we get it down to 30 or 40, that would be beneficial. But I still think that uh, some of these roads uh, do need to be uh, updated and kept updated 
so that they don't fall into disrepair because that that is kind of a discerning thing is to you know drive some of these roads where they have um, say done an overlay or a completely rebuild and okay. then they don't do maintenance on them that is recommended uh, at the national level to keep them in good shape. So we put that money in there and we haven't done our due diligence on making sure that we keep um, you know those roads up to date. So with that, I'd just like to take suggestions from people as far as what month we might want to look at that and what information we want to gather to have that discussion. Hey Larry, I got with the students on things. That's a that's an unfair um, trail of what our folks do or don't do. Our folks do the very best they can with the resources that they have available to them, and I want to make that point very clear. Uh, oh, and Scott, I yeah, Scott, I completely agree with you. You know, it it's not their it's not their issue. You know, it's an issue of them having the resources to be able to keep that up because what they do keep up, they do a real good job on. And um, it's just a matter of being able to, you know, keep it up. Oh, I would say I have to leave. So I just wanted to say that any meeting we have based on that, we have to allow Scott's staff to get to the point where they can actually so they need to do this deep dive, figure out how far behind we are, what kind of money they need, because we can't do a theoretical meeting where we know there's a shortfall. Um, it would just be really helpful to say, okay, this is what we would need if we were at 100%, and then we can start talking about the resources. So I think on a meeting like that, we have to let Scott, it's going to have to be way later next year and let Scott choose the date on that. Um, because we have to do it at a time when his staff has the data ready. Commissioner, thank you. I think, I mean, the, re the realities of the situation are, um, I think it's a, it's a deep understanding of where our funding comes from and what the constraints on that funding are. There are certain categories of our funding that there's a give back to, to municipalities so that if we increase that funding, we're basically giving away half of what we increased. So um, I know Sherry Cassidy and her folks spent a lot of energy trying to figure that out. And we have done some things uh, sort of at the staff level within the county. Um, as an example, we moved all of, of the engineering staff payroll out of the road and bridge fund into the general fund to make room within road and bridge to protect the dollars that we have. Um, that's an efficiency that we gain without getting, without going out and finding additional resources but it's, an, it's a, a creative solution for basically moving, changing the colors of the money to, to give us more room for road and bridge funds. Um, as, we, as we do those kinds of creative solutions and we also capture the data on what our true needs are uh, in all of our program areas and our programmatic shortfalls, um, you know, having an understanding of that sometime in the late 2021 season to point to Commissioner Williams' comment um, isn't going to change our revenue stream much for 2022. You're looking three to five years out before you have any impact on it. But I think this group needs to understand in detail uh, where those funds come from and what the constraints on them are. I think that's a very important first step. So maybe this is two meetings. Maybe it's it's a budget deep dive, and then later in the year it's a needs deep dive. Um, ideally, ideally the first meeting is not admiring the problem but starting a solution. Yeah. Oh, we, we must first seek to understand and without without that level of understanding i don't know that we can be terribly productive but i'm excited about the conversation i appreciate the dialogue well what we can do scott is uh, you know sort of discuss it in our uh, january and february meetings and see how your staff is coming on you know putting together uh, the information and then we can get a better idea of when we can schedule something to go over all this information. Does that sound reasonable? Why don't we pick a date and first quarter for the budget process understanding and then sometime in third or fourth quarter for the what our needs are understanding. Hey, Larry, this is Tom. I'd like yes. to make a 
comment about the customer service report uh, about the way it's structured. As I read the report, there were 1,272 requests, 101 surveys came back. So the next line below that says no replies, zero. There were actually 1,171 no replies. The other thing is, I think there we should just get rid of the no reply column entirely, have the first one be extremely dissatisfied, then moderately dissatisfied, and then neither satisfied or dissatisfied, and then satisfied, and then extremely satisfied, because you front-loaded this. I've got an example in my neighborhood. There's a stop sign that needs to be used. I know it's a stop sign because it's got six sides. That's about all you can tell on it. You can barely read the STOP on it. To get extremely satisfied for me on that, I would have to get that, sit there in my car and have a crew show up in, a, in an hour to fix that. Otherwise, it's something below that and moderately dissatisfied is too far. That's that's not the right answer. But I'm not given an option to be either, I'm either ecstatic or I'm dissatisfied. So that whole report has to be changed. Well, Tom, you know, we've had this discussion several times uh, over some of the previous meetings as far as, you know, the different lines and the different, um, you know, connotations relative to those lines. And uh, Scott's put in some input to it. Uh, Jennifer, Troy, uh, they've all put in put into it. And, uh, you know, we don't. It's an item that seems to keep coming up, but we don't come up with a adequate solution that satisfies everybody. Go ahead, Scott. If I could just interject, maybe table this conversation for now. I am uh, moving forward. I have approval to hire a customer service manager. Um, and if I can get through the wickets with HR, I'll have that posted, have set that uh, position here sometime in January. I don't want to blow the top off of the details of some reorganization we're doing on in terms of uh, administrative slash customer service functions here within the department, but I will have um, a senior leader dedicated to overseeing all customer service and dispatch operations um, within the next 60 days. And that senior leader um, will address this concern, but also more importantly, the, the main reason I'm doing this and the main reason I'm hiring this position is to take all of the other staff employees within the county uh, Department of Public Works that get pulled into the customer service business. You know, I have engineers involved, I have uh, superintendents involved, I have foremen involved in finding the citizens, and we're going to take all of that time and give it back to those uh, line level field leaders and let them focus on their field tasks and consolidate the customer service function in the interaction with the citizens. And the goal isn't to, the goal is not to uh, get citizen stovepipe. The goal is to make the organization more efficient and get consistent answers to those citizens as we deal with that. This survey is, is to, be, to be candid, one of about 17 tasks in that bucket for that customer service manager. Um, and, uh, you know, we got, I got some organizational challenges that I want to take care of as a part of that. Um, in addition to that, you know, we're also doing some hiring for some additional leadership and some, some back, some backroom staff for, for highway to get those leaders focused on their daily functions and get them focused on their employees and take care of the, the, the back door side of this organization that's distracting them from doing that. So I, I, I don't, I'm not prepared to do a deep dive on that today, but perhaps at our next meeting, I'll spend that part of my administrative time on that. Good solution, Scott. All right, thank you. Johnny, you had a comment? And uh, yes, I just wanted to add to all of you, feel free to email me all the suggestions, each of you individually, that we ask them all together and present them to Scott and Jennifer, that way they can get it at the, at their level, so they know what you guys are suggesting. That way, it's we are really looking at apples to apples. So please email me, you know, the old report you would suggest, and that way we can take a look at together. That would be an awesome way to start it too. All right, thank you, Scott. Should we look at uh, having a meeting in March to start delving into that uh, budget? 
which would be the first March, March would be appropriate. We'll do a, just a special agenda on understanding DPW funding or something like that. So we'll add a, a meeting to the in March, which would be your first quarter, which is what you recommended. And uh, so, Yana, we need to add that to the uh, uh, annual schedule at this point for 2021. I will add it. So I will also send that invitation then for the third Wednesday in March. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? The next item we have uh, topics for the next meeting. I think we've discussed the couple items that we want to, or a couple three items actually we want to have uh, for the next few meetings. So unless somebody else has something else. Uh, I think we've uh, covered all the future topics that we have. Yana, did we get any comments from the public that we need to address? You going to take off, off mute? There you go. Yes. So as of right now, I have not received any comments or anything from Natalie. Let me double check quickly here. And nothing else there. Natalie, if you are on, could you just confirm that we are good to go? No comments. Yana, no comments. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. With that, uh, Yana and I would like to um, wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And hopefully, 2021 is going to be a lot better than 2020. So with that, uh, I want to wish everybody a happy holidays, happy new year. And uh, with that, the meeting is adjourned at 10.56 a.m. Thank you very much, everyone.